Hi, welcome to Pyography Made Easy. I'm Brenda. In this tutorial episode, I'm going to explain how to create a sepia and gray tone value finder. There have been a number of pencil artists I've been watching who recommend using the gray tone value finders to help them determine how dark or light to make an area in their artwork. And I thought it would be great to have one that I could use for pyography. I couldn't find one, so I made my own, and I'm going to show you how you can make one too. So let's get to work. Tonal burn exercise. Let's start with the tonal burn exercise. Use the shader of your choice and burn in a patch of really pale tan. Then burn in another patch of tan color, but make it a shade or two darker than the first one. I am using uniform strokes for this, and I have my burner set just high enough to get a burn result. I did not increase the heat setting on my burner, but instead relied on reburning to build up the color. Continue to create additional burn patches that get progressively darker in color. Now at some point you will probably need to increase the heat setting on your burner, but adjust it in very small increments. One function of this exercise is to discover the range of tonal values you can create via reburning. You should be burning on the same paper that you will be using to create the value finder with. I am using 140 pound hot pressed 100% cotton watercolor paper by Meaden. I will put a link to the paper in the description below. I don't know if this is the best paper to burn on, but I was happy with the results I got. After you are done with the tonal burn exercise, assign the patches a number. You can lump patches together if they seem too similar in color. I used the number zero to indicate the patch with no color. This would be the equivalent of unburned wood. I had to renumber some of my values to end up with an even number. So my value finder will have 13 sepia tones plus the one unburned patch. Divide the total number in half, which for me is 7, and now we're ready for the next step. Sepia values. Sorry my head is partially in the way. We need to make a grid. The grid needs to be four squares across or horizontal squares, the number of vertical squares that matches half of what your total values will be. So for me, I need seven vertical squares. I am making my squares three quarters of an inch in size but you can make yours any size that you like. I chose to use an ink pen to draw in the lines, but you can use a pencil. After your grid is done, assign numbers next to the squares. Yes, I left out a line on my grid, and I did fix it after I numbered them. Listen, I never claimed to be a rocket scientist. Secure the paper to a backer board. I am using artist white tape, but for this any tape will work. The backer board I'm using is a scratch board by Ampersand. I'll put a link to both items in the description below, but keep in mind you can also use thick cardboard or plywood. You do need a backer board, as this will prevent the paper from warping and prevent heat transfer during the darker burns. Paper isn't very thick, so anything that's underneath it when you're burning darker can turn brown. Cut along the edge of your tonal burn. If you are right-handed, cut on the right edge, not the left. Test out your pen tip on a scrap piece of paper before burning on the grid. 
Secure the tonal exercise next to the second square. The first square represents unburned wood, so leave it completely alone. If you are right-handed, it will probably be easier to work if you secure the tonal exercise to the left side of the grid. Build a square with color that matches the value on your tonal exercise for that number. I recommend using uniform strokes as the burn method since it tends to produce smoother and more consistent results. Take your time and work carefully on your value finder. This is a very valuable tool to have in pyography, so it is well worth spending the time to produce a quality product. After you fill in the square with uniform pale tan color, move your tonal burn exercise paper down and start on the next square. What I found that worked well for me was to burn in a small area of the square next to the tonal burn exercise. Then I moved the tonal burn exercise away from the square. Afterwards, I filled in the rest of the square with color that matched that small area I initially burned. Always test your pen tip on the scrap paper before burning on the grid. This will help make sure that your pen tip is at a good temperature and prevent any dark blotches from happening when the pen tip first touches the paper. If for some strange reason I don't have scrap material to test the pen tip heat level on, I will blot the pen tip on a really dark area of the artwork before I start burning in light or unburned areas. As I mentioned before, I am using uniform strokes as my burn method. Mostly I burn them in a vertical direction, starting at the top of a square and pulling the pen tip at a constant steady speed towards the bottom of the square. Occasionally, I will burn the strokes horizontally, but that would be when I'm working near the bottom edge of the square. If you end up with some dark blotches or uneven patches, you can use the sharp blade of a knife to gently scrape away some of the color, but be careful because you can damage the paper. As you burn in each square, make sure that it is one to two shades darker than the last square. Do your best to create smooth, uniform color. Keep in mind that the paper you use can have an impact on the burn results. I'm using hot pressed paper, which has a much smoother texture than cold pressed paper. Use a piece of scrap paper and burn a small area on it that matches the color of this last square. I forgot to record this when I actually did it, but I think you understand what I'm doing. Now start on the next row of sepia-toned squares. Make sure to leave an empty row of squares between the two rows of sepia ones. The empty row is where the gray tones will go. After you get a section burned in on the new square, use the burn test from the last square and double check it against the color on the new one. When the squares are touching, it is easy to compare their darkness levels. This check is a workaround since this square isn't touching the last one and it's a lot harder to compare them at that point. The rest of the sepia value finder is straightforward. Burn in each square individually. Use uniform strokes to get the smoothest burn results. Make sure each new square is a shade or two darker than the last square. Remember, you are creating a tool that can be extremely useful in pyography. Take your time and produce a quality tool. Each square took me 10 to 15 minutes to burn in and some a little longer than that. After I'm finished showing you how to make the value finder, 
I will demonstrate how to use it. I have to tell you that I have done some projects that I wished I had had a value finder to use on them. It would have made it a lot easier to determine how dark to burn in areas. It can be helpful to rotate the paper when working along the lower edges of the square. Here's how my sepia value finder looks so far. Gray tone exercise. Now let's do a gray tone exercise. If you are using pencils you're not familiar with, then color in some small areas just to get an idea of what they can do. Try using the same pressure with each pencil. The reason is that pressing hard on the pencil will produce a darker line, and you want to compare these equally. I am using a set of pencils I bought on Amazon, and I bought them because they went up to 12B. I had never seen graphite pencils go that dark before. I put a link to the set in the description below. As I am testing out the pencils, I'm creating two columns or rows of color. The column on the right I used as light a pressure as possible. The one on the left, I used a firmer pressure. We'll call it a medium pressure. I did this just for comparison purposes. After you're done trying out all the different pencils, rub over the graphite to smooth out the pencil lines. I am using a blending stump, but almost anything will work for this like a tortillion, a q-tip or cotton tip, or even a piece of paper towel. It really doesn't matter. Once you have an idea of what the pencils are capable of, then select one and test out what layering the graphite can do. This is the same process that pyographers do when they reburn over areas to build up the color. With pencil, you can apply more layers to get darker results, but it does help to apply the layers in different directions. So I applied the first layer vertically, the second layer horizontally, and the third layer diagonally. Now, use that same pencil and see what range of gray tones you can create with it. You might be surprised to know that I'm using a 2H pencil, which is pretty light in color. As you create darker values, you will need to apply more layers of graphite. At some point, you will also need to apply more pressure to the pencil. One last thing to know is that using the point of the pencil will produce a darker line than the side, as you can press more firmly on it to get a darker result. Plus, the point will get down into the tooth or the paper texture better, and that makes it look darker too. Gray values. Now let's apply the gray values to the value finder grid. Start with your lightest color and fill in the second square with uniform color. Remember the first square represents unburned wood, so leave it alone. Rub over the graphite with a clean blender of your choice to smooth the pencil, fill in gaps, and remove individual pencil marks. If you get the color too dark, gently rub over the area with an eraser. I'm using a kneadable eraser, but any pencil eraser will work. Continue to work your way down the grid, filling each square with gray tone. Make sure each new square is one to two shades darker in color than the previous square. Using the side of the pencil will cover more area and give you fewer pencil lines. This will make the color look smoother. Make sure to blend each square with a clean blender, and then do any fine tuning of the color before moving on to the next square. Use the pencil values that you like to color in the squares. I ended up using a total of eight different pencils. I probably could have used fewer, but I was trying to avoid applying really heavy layers of graphite as it can get a silvery sheen, and I don't like how that looks. 
As you watch me color in the gray values, you will notice how I apply graphite, blend, adjust, apply more graphite, erase, blend some more, etc. I have a secret to confess. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Once I get fixated on something, I will nitpick it to death. Quite truthfully, I worked on the gray values longer than what was really necessary. I point this out because I don't want you to think that creating gray tones is difficult or as complicated as it might seem in the video. Instead, it's just me having one of my neurotic perfectionist moments. Once you are done applying gray tones to the value finder, look it over and do any last minute fine tuning that may be needed. I used a blending stump to help push the color into the small gaps along the edges that I missed. Make sure to clean your blending stump before working on lighter colored squares. When you are satisfied with your value finder, apply one to two coats of final sealant. This will keep the graphite from smearing when you use it. Assembly After the sealant has dried, cut off the surplus paper around the grid. You can use scissors, a sharp knife, and a metal straight edge, or if you have a paper trimmer, that would be perfect for this job. Once the surplus paper is gone, then cut the value finder in half. Do a fit test to ensure they are similar in size. Then apply paper glue to the back of one finder. Any paper glue, like Elmer's white glue, will work just fine. Afterwards, place the two finders together with the tonal value sides facing outward. Then press them firmly together. Place the finder on a glue-safe surface or wrap it in saran wrap and place a weight on it. Allow it to sit for 30 minutes or so and then your finder will be ready. You may need to trim any excess white paper off the edges. Lastly, use a hole punch and make half circle holes along each square. This is so you can isolate values that you want to identify. Using the value finder. I'm going to determine the gray tone value for the light area on the leaf. Place the gray tone side of the value finder on the area and compare the color on the finder with the photo. Continue to compare different gray value squares until you find one that you think matches or that is closest in color to the area. Then, use the sepia side of the finder and burn in the area to match the color on the finder. You can isolate the burn to get a better comparison. I'm a touch dark on this one, but for what I'm doing, that's okay. Let's do that again, but this time we'll find the dark value. Like before, Compare the different gray toned squares with the area on the photo until you find a match or one that matches closely. Then, use the sepia side of the value finder and burn in the area. Again, spot check your work if needed. With this one, I think I made a match. Well, that's it for this episode. For those of you who do not want to make your own, I scanned the one that I made and I put it on my website so you can quickly print one out. That said, I highly recommend you at least do the tonal burn exercise. The reason is that it allows you to discover the large range of tan and brown colored hues that you can create with minimal heat adjustments on your burner. So as I said before, I did scan the one I created, and it's on my website, Pyography Made Easy, and you can print your own. I'll put a link to that in the description below. Well, thank you for watching my video, and I will see you next week. Mm -hmm.